She's mad. I think she's riding. Hi, I'm Angelica. Hi, Angelica. Hi, Angelica. Okay, so I say sorry a lot, like excessively. You know those trash cans that have the kind of swing lid, swinging lids? You push, throw your trash away, and like the lid swings back. So once I was throwing away my trash, and like the lid swung, swung back really, really loudly, and I was just so startled, and I was like, oh my god, I'm sorry. And I was apologizing to the empty air, to the trash can. And so. I, I think that it's good to be able to say sorry and accept responsibility, like acknowledge when you've made a mistake. But yeah, I kind of say sorry in trivial situations. So that's why my personal commitment is to say sorry less often. I'll share two stories, two reasons why, and three actions that I've done towards achieving this commitment. And like I know it's kind of an unorthodox, kind of weird commitment to make, but it'll make sense, I promise. So my first story is, my first reason is because I realized that I kind of say sorry almost for the wrong reason. Like, I was at B play with a friend and I accidentally knocked over my glass and it was full of water and then it wasn't because all the water was on her shirt. And I like kept on handing her napkins and going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm so sorry. And she finally was like, oh, it's okay, and I stopped. And at this point I kind of realized that I wasn't saying sorry because I was sorry, I mean, I was sorry, but there was also an element of wanting to be forgiven there's a difference between acknowledging a mistake and apologizing for it and kind of going, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm a bad person, until somebody gives you attention and goes, oh, no, it's okay. Like, you're not a bad person, you're, you're good. So once I made this realization, that really helped. So I want to say sorry less because I want to say it for the right reasons and not kind of these attention-seeking ones. My second story is kind of related to the first story. Um, I do say sorry a lot, and part of it stems from my childhood, because this is going to make my parents sound bad, but like I promise they're good parents. <laughs> um, it's just that like in the past, whenever I had disagreements or fights with my parents, it was always my fault, 100% of the time. Um, no matter what, I was wrong, and I needed to apologize for it. And so once my dad bought me like a pack of yogurt, I didn't touch it for a week because I was busy, I went out, I just didn't feel like eating yogurt. And he yelled at me for it. How come you haven't touched this yogurt? I bought it just for you. And we had, of course, an argument because I was like, why are you yelling at me? Um, but at the end of the argument, um, I was back in my room and my mom came to me and she said, oh, you should apologize. And for me, it was just so ingrained to automatically kind of accept that it was my fault that I did go to my dad and apologize. And looking back, it's kind of weird because I don't think I really did anything wrong. But at the time, I went to him and I told him, you know, Thank you for buying this yogurt. I am sorry for not eating it. It was inconsiderate. Um, but now that I've kind of been able to look back and have this, have this kind of like time, I realize that it's not always my fault. And so I want, I'm personally committed to saying sorry less because I should say sorry when it's my fault. But it's not always my fault. And so now I'll share three actions that I've done towards achieving this goal. So the first is that I kind of have a mental mental cap. If I'm saying sorry to somebody three times in a row really quickly, is it really because I'm sorry or is it because I'm doing that whole, whole I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, please forgive me kind of thing? So setting that kind of mental limit really makes me more conscious of how, when, and why I'm saying sorry. The second thing that I've done is now I kind of talk to a friend about it. So recently I had a pretty big fight with my best friend and of course at the end of the argument I was just like, I felt compelled to go over and apologize for everything. But I talked to a friend first, and she helped me realize that I should say sorry because I did say some pretty mean things, but I wasn't the only one at fault, and that both of us needed to say sorry, not just me. The third thing that I've done is I tell myself that I'm awesome, because as you can imagine, always accepting the blame for any situation kind of takes a toll on your self-esteem. So. Nowadays, I kind of try to remind myself, like, give myself pep talks. Like, it's not your fault, you're okay, you're a good person, that kind of stuff. So, in summary, I've told you two reasons and three actions on why I'm personally committed to saying sorry less. I've realized that I say sorry excessively, and then I've realized that it, I say sorry when I believe it's my fault, but it's not always my fault. And so, there should be no doubt in this room that I'm really trying, that I've made progress. I mean, 
last week my friend tricked me and I said sorry as I fall through the air. But I'm getting better. Thank you. We're going to start in this corner today. <laughs> Okay, good. Angelica, let's talk about your speech. Let's start with the positive. It was something very personal and private. You don't normally talk about excessively apologizing too much, so you shared something kind of, you know, private in nature that you're trying to work on, so thank you for, for having the courage to do that. That was good. I appreciate that. And you had a funny intro that was cute. I expect, I thought you were going to tie back to it and say sorry at the end for going over time or something, which you didn't do, by the way. But um, uh, but that was a cute and nice introduction. On your um, first reason, your uh, story of spilling the water and finding it excessive and so forth, that was a good story. And, and illustrative of the problem. On your second reason, yes, that's the apologizing to your father for the yogurt was kind of sad. Uh, suggests a kind of uh, a relationship now that you're becoming more independent. You, you see uh, what, what all of that means and so forth. But um, yeah, that was a very telling story and a very interesting story that you shared there. Um, I say it here, and I think it would help you relax if you would move purposefully three times. You know, one, two, three, over here, work this side of the room, work this side of the room, then come back to the center. Each time going into the power stance, when you come to a stop and staying in the power stance, I think that would really help you. Your... Um, Three actions were good in terms of talking to friends and not apologizing every time automatically, reflexively, and that sort of thing. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all fine. Um, you left out one part of the the prompt, which was after you say the action, you're supposed to say how you feel about taking the actions, that, that fourth step, and that's to draw your audience back in on your feeling state. So uh, note to everyone else, if you've left off that fourth state, make sure it's there and stick it back in. But other than that, it was a very personal uh, speech that you gave with good storytelling. So thank you. I didn't catch how long did you do? You were uh, right under, you were 514. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Okay, that will bring us to <coughs> Julia Wood. I think it's a person. I skipped somebody. I skipped Shaft. Shaft. Nicole? Not me. Oh, Nicole? Yeah. Nicole Brown Simpson. Am I next? 
be Angela. Oh, I skipped Nicole. Sorry. Okay, have a seat. <laughs> okay, and thank the you. Are at the okay, thank you. Take this thumbprint. Yes, we do. Starfleet. Okay, she's managing the team. By the way, uh, Tom sent me a good email question. I wanted to say it to everyone. The list on the class website is by no means exhaustive. You can do your PC on any topic you want to. So I thought I made that clear, but I apparently didn't. So do it on any question. Any subject you want that you're committed to and, and is personal in nature. <coughs> okay, managing attention, communicating respect non verbally. You got your audience in hand. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> Just do it. As I'm sure you all know, this is Nike's advertising slogan. It's short, but it's actually a really good motto to live by. To just do what you want to do, make a decision, stick to it, and just go for it. So today, I want to share with you my personal commitment to being more decisive. I'm going to share with you two reasons why I want to be more decisive, and three actions I've taken to demonstrate this personal commitment. I think everyone can use a little reminder to just make their choices and stick with them, so that's why I want to share with you my stories. The first story I want to share with you is about my grandma and her shopping habits. I spent a week with her last summer, and I got to see how she ran errands. We went into Target, and as I'm sure anyone who's ever been into Target has experienced, it can just suck you in and you can just spend hours in there. But my grandma's very determined, and we spent 30 minutes and got every single thing on her list. And I'm the type of person who can go in there for one thing and just spend an insane amount of time because there's so many decisions to make. What do I want? Do I want this? Do I want that? I just don't know. But watching her, was kind of inspirational in a way because she just got in and got out and it was a little bit of inspiration for me to be more decisive. The second story I want to share with you is um, about planning a spring break trip with my friends last year. We decided my senior year that we wanted to go to Florida just on our own to do something fun, but if you've ever planned anything with friends, it can be very challenging. So the first decision we had to make was trying to pick a place to stay. It took forever. Everyone had a different opinion, and no one wanted to be the one to say, okay, we're just going to do this. And <coughs> after finally a month, we finally decided on a place. But then buying the plane tickets, everyone was like, oh, well, maybe then something better will come along. Like, we don't know. And we ended up waiting until the very last minute when finally me and my friend were like, okay, we're out of options. We just have to pick <coughs> And we ended up all on separate flights and probably paying way more than we needed to. So this was a great inspiration for me to just be more decisive because we literally paid the price for not being decisive. <laughs> now, third, I'd like to share with you some actions that I've taken towards being more decisive. The first action was when I painted my room. I had this whole color thing going on and it was just too much for me. So I decided to paint it white to get some serenity in my life. And if you've ever looked at paint samples at Lowe's or Home Depot, they have millions of whites. I never knew there could be so many whites. So I told myself, okay, I just have to limit myself, and I picked out a couple of sample sticks, and it was very hard to do, but you know what, I did it, and then I picked out a couple actual samples, and I had my room completely painted within a week. This was really rare in my house, because my mom's indecisive, and every paint job that we've ever done in my house has been very stressful. But this one was just relaxing and quick, and it was great, and I was kind of proud of myself for kind of turning the tables in my house. and. Now, my second story is um, when I pierced my ears. One Sunday morning, I was sitting around and thinking, you know what, I could use another ear piercing. So rather than overthinking, should I do it? Maybe I don't want it, I don't know. I just like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And I pierced my ears and I was happy with it and I didn't go back on it or regret it or anything. So I was really proud of myself for taking that step and not spending a lot of time debating on it. Now, the third story I wanna share is coming to UCLA. I didn't plan very well, so I applied to about 10 different colleges. And when the time came to actually make a decision, I ended up with a lot of different opinions on where I should go. Some people wanted me to go here, some people wanted me to go there. No one wanted me to come out to California, though, because it's very far away from where I live in St. Louis. So um, 
in the end, I did decide to come here, and there was a lot of deliberation. I could have gone to a lot of places, and they all would have been great, but I knew I wanted to come here, so I made the decision, and rather than over the summer stressing about, well, maybe I should have gone here, maybe I shouldn't have, I just enjoyed my choice and looked forward to coming here, and I'm really happy with it. So um, but those are the three actions I've taken, and I felt really proud of myself for doing that. In summary, I have shared with you two reasons I want to be more decisive and three actions I have taken to demonstrate this commitment. Um, there should be no doubt in this room that I really am committed to being more decisive. Um, overall, I think everyone can use the advice to be more decisive because there's a lot of choices in life and it's easy to <coughs> get caught up in all the options and not end up making a decision. But um, sometimes you just have to do it and go with it. Just like Nike says, just do it. Thank you. Thank you. 439. Okay, we're here. Hi, my name's Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Um, I, I really like your speech. I like the fact that everything, I don't know why, everything seems like really descriptive, but at the same time, you really got through it like quickly. It was just really like succinct, and I just really like the way, the pace that you <coughs> how you um, sort of gave us enough to, to relate to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. You like the pace, yes. okay. Improvement? <laughs> I'm Karen. Um, Hi, Karen. So, I also thought your speech was like, really tight, and um, I was able to follow it very well. Um, so some suggestions would just be that I think I'm, I think you were really feeling sometimes, and that kind of distracted me, because I'm like, oh, is there something up there? And, um, I really liked your stories, they were relatable. Um, you kind of talked a little bit fast. I like listening to fast talking people. I'm one myself, but sometimes people like listen at different speeds and like finish that. Yeah, thank you. Nicole, um, one of the things I wrote in big letters was to slow down and to vary the pace. Um, you had about 30 seconds left, so you could have had, one of your goals was vocal variety. Give us a chance to let some of the words sink in at some of the time. and it, Otherwise, it appears you're just, just plain nervous or scared and you want to get <coughs> through it. And I know you're not that scared and nervous. You're pretty, you're pretty self-contained up there. So you knew your speech well, and so that was good. You started with a Nike uh, campaign, a lot of people use it, it's catchy, it's good, it's a thing, it gets right to the point. Uh, you got through all your preliminaries in 34 seconds, so I knew you were on a really fast roll for your preliminaries, a lot of people take about a minute to do that, so I knew you were really flying. Um, on your first story of your grandmother and Target, and she has a list, she gets her list and she leaves Target, that was, that was a good story, and it, it points up the idea that, um, you know, I have shopping to do, I get it done, I leave. I would have liked a little moral to the story at the end of, here's a really great example of somebody that, if you want to go with the extended metaphor of my who just does it, just does her shopping and gets out or something, I don't know, but something, the moral would have been good. On your second story, yes, um, that's a great story of procrastination and paying a lot of money for late airline tickets, and that was, everyone can really relate to that. So that was a good story. On your um, third story, you had three stories, and so um, you talk about painting your room white, and that was okay. And then you talk about uh, piercing your ears, and you just did it. And then you talk about going to UCLA, and you just chose it. I think that one of the things that came to my mind and probably comes to some of the audience members' minds and probably to your mind is is discerning the difference between being decisive and being impulsive. And, you know, people, and we think people that are decisive, are, it's a desirable trait, people that are impulsive, it's not, not so. 
desirable. So you may want to meditate on that difference and think about that a little bit more. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all good. You said you wanted to have more vocal variety, move three times, and don't rush. How'd it go? Not so good. Um, yeah. I forgot to move a little bit, so mm -hmm. that wasn't so good. And I did talk very fast, so I'll have to work on that again next time. Yeah, and what I would say, Nicole, is if when you practice with a study buddy or a live person as opposed to a mirror or whatever, however you practice, if you practice actually moving three times, then it's going to be a real natural thing you do when you come up here in front of people. Thank you. Okay, now that I skipped Nicole, let's now hear from Julia. Hi, Julia. How you doing? That's good. And your goals are somewhere? I don't know. Oh, okay, good. That's good. Okay. Thank you. She's writing. Yeah. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Julia. Hi Julia. Hi, Julia. Oh um, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Sorry. Thumb for him. Okay. Okay. Um, throughout my entire life, I've always struggled with having really bad anxiety. Whether it's anxiety over really silly things such as schoolwork or anxiety <coughs> that comes from being in fights with people I really care about, I freak, about, freak out about the consequences of my actions to the point where my worries literally consume my mind. Now when I think about a time in my life when this wasn't a problem, the only thing that pops up into my head is my childhood. I had a really good childhood and I think it's because I had great parents, I embraced the present moment, and I didn't have a care in the world. So today, I want to share with you my personal commitment to being a carefree kid at heart. I will give you two reasons why I'm personally committed to being a carefree kid at heart, and three actions that I have taken to demonstrate this personal commitment. I'm sure at one point or another, we have all wished that we could be a kid again, and I really do believe that being a kid is a carefree mindset that we can carry throughout our entire lives. The first reason that I'm committed to being a carefree kid at heart comes from me babysitting my little cousin Olivia over the summer three years ago. When I babysat her, I loved playing Barbies with her and creating a magical world where Barbie married the man of her dreams and every, had every one of her dreams come true. Um, one day when I was babysitting her, though, I was having a lot of anxiety about college and how my family was going to pay for it. So when she asked me to play Barbies with her, I just told her that I was too tired and that we should watch TV. At first she was like, oh, okay, and then turned around and walked away. But after about five minutes, she came back running to me, sat in my lap, opened her arms real wide and put her arms around me and said, Julia, you look sad. Don't look sad because that makes me sad. There's always a reason to smile and be happy and Barbie can make you happy, I promise. Um, and at that moment, not only did I smile because I thought it was so cute, but as juvenile as this sounds, I really do feel like I had an epiphany. I realized that unless the situation concerns life or death, there's really no reason to stress, stress out about it or have anxiety, but there's always a reason to stress <coughs> Her pure and innocent outlook on life taught me that if I just put my problems in the grand scheme of things, I could realize that my problems really aren't problems at all because they can be fixed. I think the most important thing I learned, though, was that my worrying really prevents me from having fun and spending time with people I care about, and that's something I really need to change. The second reason why I'm personally committed to being a carefree kid at heart comes from a memory I have in the second grade. When I was younger, my dad used to take me to Toys R Us, and every time we went to Toys R Us, I was obsessed with buying this one toy called Polly Pockets. Polly Pockets are like these little figurines that wear really colorful rubber clothing, and at the time I thought they were the cutest thing in the world. So one day when I bought my new Polly Pocket ballerina set, I was so excited that I decided to bring it to school the next day. At resource, recess, I took out my Polly Pocket set and started playing with them. And immediately this boy named Danny Tedeschi started making fun of me, and he made fun of me the entire time. But looking back, I realized that the entire time he was making fun of me, I knew it, but I didn't care at all because I was having so much fun playing with my toys. This story is significant to me because it makes me realize that today I care a lot more about the consequences of my actions 
and what others think of me than I used to, and it brings me so much anxiety. It really makes me sad knowing that I used to be so carefree and confident, but this story serves as a reminder and a motivator to be the carefree and confident girl I once was who wasn't embarrassed to show people what I loved or what I cared about. Um, okay, so now I will share with you three actions that I have taken to demonstrate my personal commitment. The first thing I've done is I've become a mentor for a mentorship program on campus that works with kids through ages 7 to 17. My mentee is 8 years old and she teaches me to enjoy the little things in life with hanging out with my friends or going to see a movie and every time I'm with her I really do feel my worries just go away. The second action that I've taken is that I've become a pack rat in the sense that I refuse to throw away any significant toy or stuffed animal from my childhood because I feel each one carries a memory that reminds me of carefree and happy times when I was with my parents, knowing that they would be with me through every struggle I faced as long as they could. The third action that I've taken is I still continue to babysit my little cousin Olivia to this day. She encourages me to embrace the little kid inside of me and every time I'm with her, I have so much fun and I forget about all my problems. When I perform these actions, I feel very pure and happy in a very carefree way. I definitely have less anxiety, I'm more calm, and I'm ready to take on the world with a greater peace of mind. In summary, I have shared with you two reasons why I'm personally committed <coughs> to being a carefree kid at heart, and three actions that I have taken to demonstrate this personal commitment. The positivity of my little cousin Olivia served as a catalyst for this personal commitment. And the memories I have as a child served as a reminder as to why I hold this commitment so close to my heart. I really do feel that embracing the mindset of being a carefree kid is the best way for me to cope with my anxiety. And while it isn't socially acceptable for me to play with Polly Pockets anymore today because I'm so much older, um, I will never forget the positive memories the Polly Pockets brought into my life and the carefree times that I played with them. Thank you. Five fourteen. <coughs> okay. Um, so I really enjoyed. Your oh, name, sorry, please. I'm Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Like, I shared a little bit about my counseling and anxiety, like in uh, a speech before. So. I really related to it, and I think the way you presented it was really well. Um, and as usual, as usual, you're really fluid, and your pace is good. Um, I really like your confidence, and I think the way you moved three times was really um, like clear and good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Improvement. Hi, I'm Angelica. Hi, I'm Angelica. Um, <coughs> like, I don't have anything. I don't have anything to say because like your speech was really really good. Um, I think maybe I think like you didn't look at this side as much, but like that's like it. <laughs> Thank you, Angelica. Let's talk about your speech, Julia. It was clearly personal. You had one second left, so you took all your time. That was good. You had a good pace. You talked about your anxiety, and uh, that was clearly a personal thing, and uh, your solution for it was to become more uh, childlike, a kid at heart. You know, E. Cummings has a famous poem he wrote, and down they forgot as up they grew, you know, and it's very true, we forget the childlike innocence we had as we get older and sophisticated, you know, we, we lose a lot of that childlike innocence and carefreeness that we had when we were younger. Okay, let's talk about your storytelling. Your first story was excellent. Um, your uh, babysitting charge, Olivia, um, uh, it was just the right amount of details. You had dialogue in there, so you, you had her speaking and her, what she said was, you know, um, heartwarming and it was good, and then you had a moral to your story at the end, so you said what, what the story meant and how you had an epiphany there. And, you know, I think the, the insight that you're coming to, and there, there's, a, there's a school of psychotherapy called Rational Emotive Therapy, which, which posits the idea that it's, it's not how big the problem is, but it's how we think about the problem. And some people just have this catastrophic view of the world. Oh my God, this is catastrophic. And it is catastrophic if you think it is so. 
But if you have a, you have a balanced perspective on what's going on, then it's balanced, and your problems come. You know, you think about your problems in a more balanced way. Um, your second uh, story um, I like about Polly Pockets, uh, and I love the details of Danny. Tedeschi, is that his name? Tedeschi. Tedeschi, yeah. That really helped yeah. that detail. You know, I can just see this little punk making fun of you. Um, and uh, as, as only uh, Danny Tedeschi can. And um, I think that uh, you, uh, your moral and how you related to it and look back on it was, was definitely good storytelling there, but it helped support over your overall personal commitment to um, what you're going after. On your actions, um, your mentoring was uh, good and uh, your three actions were all consistent with your PC, so that was good. Your summary, your conclusion, and tieback were all good and um, no, I liked the speech a lot. It was well done. Thank you. Oh, wait, let's look at your goals real quick. What was your goal? Where were your goals? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> I think oh, here they are. Not to have dismantling in my hands. Is this, is um, this distracting, hand distracting hand gestures. <laughs> to be enthusiastic and to exclude unnecessary details. Yeah, I think you covered that. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, that brings us to Shabby. Did I skip anyone? Julia and then Shabby. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm swell. Glad to hear it. So, your audience <laughs> with you? She's doodling over there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, alright. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Shabby. Hi Shabby. Alright, so famous silent film star and comedian Charlie Chaplin once said that a day without laughter is a day wasted. I cannot agree more with Mr. Chaplin, and that's why today I'm going to share with you my personal commitment to laugh and make others laugh every day. Um, to, yeah. So I'm going to share uh, two reasons why this is my personal commitment and three actions that I have taken to achieve this. And I think that it is important and it should be important to everyone because laughter can help you get through any situation, but especially the tough times and the difficult ones. So the first reason that I am committed to making people laugh and making myself laugh every day is because it really helps you get through those tough times. Uh, I know when I was little and I would get yelled at by my parents or get in trouble for anything, I would always run straight to my VCR and pop in a video cassette of Aladdin. And I loved that movie, it was my favorite movie growing up. And no matter how sad or angry or frustrated I was, the genie, played by the late Robin Williams, always managed to get a, a laugh or a giggle out of me. Um, and of course, this has followed me throughout my life. Now, even when I am frustrated about school or friends or whatever it may be, my first instinct is always to run to Netflix or um, just go to a movie theater and watch a comedy. Um, personally, my favorite at the moment is Parks and Rec. Um, and uh, Nick Offerman always manages to get a laugh out of me no matter what the situation, and I always feel better afterwards. Uh, similarly, when my friends are going through tough situations, whether it's bad grades or a breakup or whatever, I always try to make them laugh, usually at the expense of their ex, but they're not there, so it doesn't matter. Um, and I know that when they feel better, I feel better too. And so making my friends feel better and making myself feel better um, by laughing really helps me to not get bogged down in the negative and stay positive. So the second reason that I am personally committed to laughing and making my friends laugh every day is because it helps me to express myself. Believe it or not, 
In um, elementary school and middle school, I was actually a really shy kid. I didn't talk to basically anybody. I had a really hard time making friends, and I had a really hard time expressing myself because I was always too scared to say anything. Then, in high school, I discovered the magical world of sarcasm and humor, and much to my dad's dismay, it became my primary convention, um, conventional method of <coughs> conveying um, my opinions. And I rely on that now more than ever. I feel like it has helped me to grow and become a more confident person, and hopefully a more humorous person. And I, I really enjoy what um, laughing every day and adding humor to my life has helped me to grow into. Now I'm going to share with you three actions that I have taken to help achieve this personal commitment. So my first action is that um, no matter what the awkward or uncomfortable situation, I always crack a joke. And I know those people aren't always everyone's favorite person in the room because they tend to make it more awkward. But for me it helps alleviate the tension and also I just feel like it, it helps me kind of back away from that shyness and that self-doubt that kind of tends to creep in when you're like the first person in class or you know whatever it may be. Um, the second action I'm taking uh, to help um, achieve my personal commitment is that no matter what the situation, I always use jokes and humor to make my friends and myself feel better. Um, it's, it's something that I feel is very important and it always helps us to stay on the positive and look at the positive side of things. And the third action I've taken to help um, achieve my personal commitment of integrating humor into my life is that I always think positively and I always laugh no matter um, what kind of tough situation I'm in. I think it helps to put things in perspective. Like, it could always be worse than it actually is. And it helps me to, like I said earlier, stay positive and not get bogged down in the negative feelings. It helps me to clear my mind and think productively and clear-headedly. So, uh, in summary, today I've told you about two reasons why laughing and making others laugh every day is my personal commitment and three actions that I've taken <coughs> to achieve this personal commitment. There should be no doubt in this room that I'm personally committed to integrating humor into my life and the lives of all those around me. So, just like Charlie Chaplin said, a day without laughter is definitely a day wasted, and I think a life without laughter is just not one worth living. Thank you. Thank you. 447, thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Get out of here. We were somewhere over here, aren't we? Um, I really liked your speech at the topic. Start was... in your name, oh. please. Hi, I'm Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Nicole. Um, like I said, I really liked your speech. I thought the topic was a good reminder to be happy and think positively, but also you're a really good speaker and you really project your voice and you come across really confident and have a good pacing. So. Mm -hmm. Very fluent. <coughs> Hi, I'm Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi. 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 I really like your speech as well. Um, very good speaker, voice fills the room, very confident. I think one improvement slightly is probably, I think you weren't making that much eye contact on this side of the room, but everywhere else you were making connections, so that was really good. Okay. Eye contact everywhere. You say your goal is to move three times, to slow down, you have about 30 seconds, and to move <coughs> constant pace, no rush in the second half. How'd it go? I think it went pretty well. Um, it definitely slowed down from when I was practicing, because when I was practicing it was three and a half minutes, and now it was like over four and a half minutes, so that's good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You were under. I moved three times, and... Um, I think it helped because I, the last couple times you've mentioned that um, my intros were too long, so this time I cut my intro down significantly. Yeah. And I think that helped to create more time for me too. So yeah. <coughs> so let's go through this and uh, see what we have. Your shorter intro was definitely more effective. I love the Chaplin intro, and uh, it was succinct and right to the point. It, I think it grabbed people. And yours, and I, I don't. I don't mind, I know it's kind of corny, but I don't mind people saying, and I think this is significant to all of you, because I, I know it, it really makes it overt, but you had a good significant statement, and it helps you in all situations through difficult times, you know, and I think that'd be significant to all of you. Uh, but that was a good significant <coughs> statement. 
On your um, first story, uh, Aladdin, and as you call, as you put it, the late Robin Williams. That made me kind of sad to hear him referred to in that way. I guess he's not. I guess he is the late Robin Williams now, but. I guess because of the magic of DVDs and videos, he'll be with us for a while anyway, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah, and I know that there's a lot of people that do turn to um, comedies or to DVDs or to, they, they watch, some people watch some things ten times, it really has a deep meaning, talks to them in a serious way. So I guess that's how you get through your... Uh, tough times, and so that was a good story. Um, on your second story, um, you said you were a shy kid, and then you got into uh, sarcasm and humor, and um, I would have liked to have had some examples of the sarcasm <coughs> and humor. That would have probably brought it home, um, made it a little more real, maybe that would have been, I don't know, maybe hurt your credibility or something, but uh, it would have been interesting to hear what you consider sarcasm and humor and crappy jokes, but uh, but anyway, um, your, your description of your transformation was interesting. <coughs> Now, your actions that you've taken were good. You expressed three different actions that you've taken to fulfill your personal commitment. What you didn't do was say, when I perform these actions, I feel. And remember to put that, put that, remember everybody, start it in your page, start it in your notes if you still have to go. When I perform these actions, I feel you know, really good, I'm really proud of myself, I'm happy that I'm fulfilling my personal commitment, you know, that, put that in there. Your summary of conclusion and tie back were all excellent, and you fulfilled your personal commitment, so you did a good job, just so, you know, eye contact <laughs> everywhere, but you did a nice job, thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to Trenton. Hi, Trenton. How you doing today? I'm tired. I'm tired. Sorry to hear that. Get to bed earlier. <laughs> Okay, let me see, she's still doodling, okay. <laughs> Managing attention, communicating respect, finding for language, friends, and feel the love, start your speech. Hi, my name's Trenton. Hi, Hi Trenton. Former RuPaul often says, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> now, today I want to share with you my personal commitment to self-love. Now, I know it sounds a little weird, self-love. But it's actually a psychological term similar to that of self-esteem. It refers to um, uh, one's ability to understand oneself, take responsibility for oneself, care for oneself, and understand oneself. And I want, and I like to be pers very personally committed to this. Um, today, I'm going to share with you two stories and three actions that I've taken to um, pursue my commitment to self-love. Um, my first um, my first action that I've, or my first story that I've, um, <coughs> my first story that I want to share with you is um, about me in high school. During my freshman year, I had really horrible self-esteem, and this kind of affected a lot of the friendships and relationships I had. One particular friendship was with this girl named Megan. Now, um, something that she used to do is she often used to criticize me for different parts about me. And then she would offer these small fixes to, you know, make me a better person. For example, she said that I was too nice to people too often. I needed to be sassier because 
I'm gay. And, you know, at first I believed her because I thought if she's noticing something about myself that I don't notice, then maybe it's something I do have to change. And even though I did realize that what, why she said this was because she wanted me to fulfill her own little stereotype of her GBF, her gay best friend, I went along with it. Now, it took some time, but eventually I did learn to love myself enough to realize that what she was doing was toxic. And it's actually because of this toxic friendship with her that I feel like that set me on my path to like loving myself and advocating myself to myself. Now, my second story that I want to share with you um, is like, or my second reason why I personally commit uh, self-love is because, <coughs> because of this like horrible, because I feel with like self-love, I'm more stable emotionally and mentally. Now, having horrible self-esteem, I used to wallow in my own self-pity. Like, I, let's say I didn't get an A on the test. Oh my god, my Asian mother is going to murder me. Um, I spilled a friend's minor secret. I'm the worst person in the world. One particular time during a volleyball game, I shanked the first pass of the game. And in my mind, this was the worst thing I could do. And so from there on, the next couple of plays, I kept on messing up because I was stuck in my head, criticizing every single action I was doing. And it got so bad to the point where I actually asked my coach to bench me. Now, if self-deprecation was an Olympic event, I probably would have had gold. Um, but I was lucky, because when I talked to her, she told me that I need to stop focusing on what I was doing wrong, and to focus on what I was managing to accomplish. The fact that I had saved a couple of plays, and that I was actually doing pretty good. Now, what she essentially was telling me is that I needed to take time to look at what I'm doing, take responsibility for my actions, and understand that I needed to respect the fact that I can move forward and better these mistakes. I needed to love what I was doing. Now, I've taken three actions to um, achieve my personal commitment to self-love. The first action is I take time at the end of my day to reflect on what's happened. During this time, I normally analyze what I, like my emotions throughout the day, uh, what I managed to accomplish, and I write this down in an online journal. I found that what, because I do this, I'm better able to like look at the good of the day and see what I did well. My second action that I've taken is that um, whenever I feel exhausted from like socializing or being with people, I take personal time for myself. This often um, starts with me either like picking up one of my favorite books and reading it or watching a guilty pleasure show on Netflix. Finally, um, my third action that I've taken is that I reward myself for like all sorts of goals. It could be anywhere from big to small, like eating a gummy bear at the end of each page of a reading, or at the end of the quarter, going to my favorite cupcake shop and buying a dozen cupcakes to eat by myself. <laughs> Not really, but kind of. Um, when I do this, I feel like, when I like advocate for myself and I like, love myself, I feel like I'm doing much better. In summary, I've shared with you, I've shared with you two stories and three actions that I've taken um, to show my commitment to self-love. Um, in summary, there's, or in conclusion, there should be no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to loving myself. Um, and like RuPaul said, um, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 528. Thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Okay, we're here. Hi, I'm Trish. Hi, Hi Trish. Trish. Um, Trish. I think you did really well on your speech. I like that you were able to walk around and that in the parts if, when you did get lost, you were able to try and pick yourself back up again. Um, I liked your bookends as well. I thought that was really nice that you were able to mm -hmm. go in full circle. And um, yeah, you're done. Improvement. I'm Maria. Hi, Maria. And I really like your speech. I liked all the, your little jokes that you did, so that was really good. And, but for improvement, I probably have like a little bit less well-placed pauses in the beginning. The rest of your speech was like really good. You were confident, but like maybe have like a little more confidence in the beginning. So still go more Yeah, I don't know uh, what it is, but I noticed this in a lot of your speeches. In the beginning, you're you're stumbling. You're not warmed up or something. You. It takes you a while to 
get a beat going and get going, but um, you were hesitant, you know. Um, in any case, I loved your intro. Uh, can I get an amen? You got a good amen from your audience, and that was a good um, audience participation. Really got them involved. That was good. Your preview was good. Um, your this was a very personal thing. You talked about this. Uh, I won't. Well, I'll just call her Megan. Uh, but you know. I've, I've seen this a lot where these people want to improve you and criticize people and it's horrible and this is and this toxic friend as you called it uh, can be very toxic friendship can be very harmful I'm glad you sort of figured it out and got out of it and so that was very uh, very good storytelling and very insightful I liked it very much um, on your second story, um, you talked about the self-pitying and, and, and sort of uh, cycling the negativity and really causing it to get you off track and keep you off track. And then you talked about the coach that said, cycle what you're doing right and put, that, put, put the good you know, chords in your head that things are going well and focus on what you're doing right and focus on self-love and I thought that was a good story too. A little long but good story. Um, your actions were good. You, um, they were all consistent with your uh, PC. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all well done, and you almost got this within time. You're, you're, you're over time every time, and so you need to really work on uh, having benchmarks and being under time because, you know, it's, it's a pity to lose five points every time on, on a great speech. So, you know, uh, just get it in time next time. Okay, thank you. This what? Oh, your goals. Okay. Yeah, time management, large volume, fewer awkward pauses. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that brings us to... They're gone, right? She Young Lin, yeah. Okay, so Malika. 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 Hi, Malika. How you doing? How's, how's the battery looking? Good, yeah. I tried to keep in there with the changes, but the pen was out of the way. It's just bad. Okay, so I'll just, every other word, I'll okay, you filled it in. Yeah. Girl. All right. And your goals are somewhere here? Okay. Yeah, my battery's running down. <clears throat> to quote one of my favorite fans, I want to thrive, not just survive. Lately, I can hope but feel that at the age of 19, I still don't quite know who I am. I'm one of those people who think that to love yourself, you have to know yourself. But I've, been, I've be begun to realize that loving yourself is also loving every version of yourself along the way. Today I'm going to share with you my personal commitment to loving myself. <laughs> Whether you're one of the lucky few who know who you are and exactly where you're going, or whether, like me, you're still trying to figure it out. Loving yourself is important and essential to your happiness. Today I'm going to share with you two stories and three actions to help you understand why and how I am personally committed to loving myself. In high school, I was very conscious of my weight, and it led me to question who I was. Was I the shy, self-conscious girl that I was in public? It was I the confident, outgoing girl that I was with my close group of family and friends. I really struggled between these two versions of myself. And every time someone called me fat or ugly, I felt myself retreating further and further into a shell. I loved to dance, and in high school, we, in the 10th grade, we had a school dance performance. And I was very excited about it. 
this teacher put me in the back row, something that would it, wouldn't really have bothered me if she hadn't made it so painfully obvious that the reason she did that was because I was the chubbiest girl in the routine. Somehow, her need to hide me translated into me hiding myself for years. It took me a very, very long time to stop letting what others said affect me and to realize that I was not my weight. I am my thoughts, my emotions, my ideas, and my beliefs. It took me ages to realize all the other potential that I had and to really start loving myself. My second story took place just a week ago. Ever since I got to UCLA, I've made a conscious effort to not let my physical appearance dominate my perception of myself. I've joined all these clubs and I've really tried to explore all these other parts of myself and love the whole of me. I'm part of a club where we mentor kids and last week I was at site and I was hanging out with two of the girls and one of them looked up to me and she said, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I was almost in tears. And you might think that's ridiculous. A kid tells me I'm cool and I start crying. <laughs> but I realized that ever since I stopped letting my appearance <coughs> dominate my concept of my self-worth, I was exponentially happier. All that time that I spent worrying about what others thought of me, I now spent finding my passion in life. And I realized that there are all these other parts of me that I have to learn to love and to understand that I am not defined by one single aspect and that I have to love every single part of me. I have taken up three actions to help me get to know myself and to love myself. The first action I've taken up is to do what I love whether that be choosing the major, choosing my major based on what I'm interested in rather than what's going to make me look money, or joining clubs which I really care about and that I'm passionate about. I'm figuring out what I love to do and then I'm doing it. My second action is to reward myself when I do something right. All my life I've attributed the good things in my life to luck or to other people. But, when I do, but now when I do something right, I take credit for it and I understand that making mistakes is just part of the process of getting it right. The third action I've taken is to actually eat healthier and to go to the gym. But for the first time, this has nothing to do with my appearance and everything to do with loving myself and taking care of the body that I've been given. So to conclude, and these actions have made me feel a lot happier and I've gotten a lot more comfortable with who I am and I feel like these actions have, got, have made me have allowed me to be the best possible version of myself because I finally feel like I'm closer to being the real me. Yeah. So to conclude, I, I have shared with you today two stories and three actions to help you understand why and how I'm personally committed to loving myself. I have spent the past year in college not reinventing myself, but getting comfortable with who I am. And I, I haven't quite figured out who I am or where I'm going, but I understand that I have to be patient with myself and I have to love every version of me and every part of me if I really want to thrive and not just survive. Thank you. Thank you. 503. Thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Hi, I'm Tess. Hi, Hi Tess. Tess. You're amazing. Um, <laughs> it was so good, and you're so inspiring, and like the whole thing really just like, even though you've had different examples and stuff, you've kept your theme going the whole time, and you really kept reinforcing your point, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Liz Bell. Hi, Liz Bell. Um, I agree, that was really good. You're a really natural speaker, and it seemed like you knew what you were going to say, but it wasn't like rehearsed, like overly rehearsed. Probably just to move a little bit more just in the second half. I think that we like kind of do our three movements and we just stay. So if you just kind of like move just like a little step forward or something like that, it can help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would relax you and, you know, make you seem a little less tense. Well, let's talk about the speech. Um, you started with a very inspiring quote. I want to thrive, not just survive. And um, that was um, a good 
tie back and book in and well done. And you launched into a, um, you know, a very introspective uh, speech and very honest one about yourself and your weight. And it was very, uh, it was very compelling uh, speech, one that I really enjoyed listening to, and I admire you for your honesty in giving it and your courage to give it. Um, you uh, talk. You had a good thesis previous so that all worked out. Um, you started out by not candy coating it or anything. You just said, in high school, I was conscious of my weight, and you know, blah blah blah, <coughs> and you. You know, you said people called you fat and ugly, and, you know, you topped it off with the dance teacher throwing you in the back row, and, you know, which had to be humiliating, and um, the chubby girl in the back, and, uh, uh, and then you had a moral to the story, which you sort of got past that, and were able to face that and sort of transform yourself out of that. And uh, that's sort of the importance and the beauty of the uh, the human being species that can evolve out of difficult situations. So I, li I like the way you realize that your potential could come out of this difficult situation. So it was a good story, very compelling story actually. <coughs> your uh, second story dealt with UCLA and how you've uh, gone to clubs and mentored people and that you uh, had one of your mentees tell you that uh, when she grows up she wants to be just like you and uh, that's no question about it, a great feeling and it you can't buy that with a uh, partnership in a law firm, trust me on that and um, uh, I think that the other stuff you said about not not how appearances can't determine your self worth and stuff like that, and um, those other comments that you made, it was a good story for your second story. Now your three actions um, of joining clubs that that get you to what what matter and. Uh, taking credit for doing something good and eating healthier, just, you know, all those things are, are consistent with your personal commitment, but that was always good. And bless your heart, you put in the fourth step, you know, I was very happy somebody put in the fourth step of how you felt about taking the actions. I was ecstatic, so thank you for that. Uh, you concluded nicely. You wanted to use vocal variety and pauses for emphasis, stress, topics, uh, in introduction and tie back, and make uh, three movements to look natural. How'd it go? I think it was well. I tried to use vocal variety. Yeah. I think that worked. Um, yeah. The second was to stress my topics. They were very specific. I didn't do that as well last time, so I yeah. tried to really slow down when I said my personal commitment. Yeah. And the third was to make the movements look more natural because I felt like in like previous oh, video it was like a very like large step. Yeah. So I just wanted to like blend it a little more. So, right. Yeah. And if you step in the direction that you're going with the step with the foot you're heading in mm -hmm. that, and don't cross your feet, that's that's yeah. a useful thing to do. So you did a very nice job. Thank you. The batteries on the bottom. I don't have anyone's here. How many do we have left? <laughs> Maybe we better change the battery. Yeah. Should I? Yeah.